Well, hello. Welcome to the Valley Church. My name is Jessica Coulter, and my husband, Mark, and I co-pastor. We've been leading at the Troy campus on, since October 2018, and being able to engage online in this past year or so has been wonderful, and we've loved getting to connect with you in this space. So when we're engaging in an online community, we love to do just that, engage and connect and communicate. And so during this time together, we'd love for you to drop emojis, to comment below, to engage and interact with your host. Um, in fact, I would love to hear what your favorite emojis are. What are your go-to emojis? Mine are pretty um, standard. I like to use the one with the party hat and the party horn. I'm an Enneagram 7, so I'm always like, woohoo, let's party. Um, that's another one I like to use is praise hands, which then is very good for today's online <laughs> experience. If you want to throw some raise the roof, praise hands up in there. And then I typically use the emoji. It's a lady like going like this and this. <laughs> I, I use those more than I'd like to admit, as well as the emoji where he's like with the squinty laughing eyes and the um, big smile because that's about what I look like. So can't wait to hear what your favorite emojis are. My family got to take a couple trips this summer. I can't believe we're halfway through if you're watching this in real time. And a few things that I've done to, to just keep that summer feeling since all our trips are over is I started making cold brew coffee and sun tea. Did anyone's mom or dad make sun tea when you were growing up? And I like to drink like Topo Chico or Limoncello LaCroix. Now I know sparkling water like Sparkling waters are kind of a divisive topic. I understand. Like, you either love them or you hate them, but I love them. And so I've been drinking those all summer just to kind of, I don't know, put me in that party summer mood. So we're just so glad you're here. And I would like to welcome today's uh, communicator is Jeff Kunselman. And we're excited to hear a great word from him today. Check out this video as we head into that wonderful message. <laughs> Thanks for joining us today. It's great to be with you. You ever wondered what people are going to say about you when you're gone? You ever wonder what people think about you now? Or maybe you're one of those who say, I really don't care what people think about me now or what they'll say when I'm gone. So let me ask this. How would you describe yourself now? You know, with the thousands of people who are in the Bible, there are very few whose lives are described in one sentence or their character is described in one sentence. One of these, though, is a man named Barnabas. In Acts 11.24, we get this one sentence description, quote, Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. Just 12 words. But why this description, and what was Dr. Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, what was his prompting or rationale for such a description? So let's, let's spend a few minutes together just looking at that. Barnabas was described as, quote, a good man. But based on what? We get some clues when we're first introduced to Barnabas back in chapter 4, verse 36 of Acts, where we read, quote, Joseph a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. So let's understand the context. Jesus has died, been resurrected, now is ascended. The Holy Spirit came on Pentecost, and now there are thousands of believers who have started to follow after Jesus. And from a human perspective, the church has been left in the hands of the apostles. It quickly grew, all kinds of people coming to believe in Jesus as Savior and Messiah. 
The Jewish religious officials, however, are both fearful and angry, and they pushed back hard. Earlier in chapter 4, we read of Peter and John being brought before these religious leaders. They are questioned, threatened, and then beaten. So here are the apostles trying to lead this, quote, new movement called a church with thousands of people of the ways and of the person of Jesus Christ while contending with the same people who not long before that had crucified Jesus. And in that context, Luke introduces a man named Joseph whom the apostles nicknamed Barnabas, meaning the encourager. Somehow, some way, Barnabas or Joseph had lifted the heads, lifted the hearts of the apostles so much so that they started, they gave him a nickname and started calling him Barnabas. You know, as, as I've reflected on this a little bit recently, I've been thinking, if people were to give me a nickname, I wonder, what would it be? What might they give you? I've thought about people who were encouragers to me. You know, one of the things that, that as I was thinking about that was that they all used words in some way to encourage. Our family lived in South Carolina for 13 years. Now, I know some of you go to Myrtle Beach or Hilton Head for vacations, but you, you've got to understand, that's not the real South Carolina. That's just a dressed up way for them to make a lot of money off of us Yankees. But we lived in, in the middle of the state and in and around Columbia, there were a lot of flea markets. You know, there you could go on any Saturday of the year and buy anything from puppies to boiled peanuts, from okra to knockoff Gucci purses. Well, a little background. The the South has, if you've never lived there, you wouldn't know this. If you've lived there, you sure know it. The South has terrible grass. We had lived over in a suburb of Columbus before we moved to South Carolina, and I was used to, to northern grass, and we had a corner lot, and the previous owner had taken considerable care to get the yard looking really good, and I worked to keep it that way. You know, this good northern grass, thick, lush, soft, beautiful. You know, when you cut it, it's got the lines in it, and you do it just the right way. But in the south, grass isn't like that. It, it's all fickle. And unlike ours that grows up, theirs just spreads out. And and it just doesn't do well a lot of times. Seemingly with no reason at all, there'll just be big patches of your yard that, that will die. And trying to grow any of that grass from seed is tedious, difficult, and without much promise. It just, and it takes forever if you go that route. So no matter uh, how rich or poor you may be, what kind of neighborhood you live in, you either live with those bare patches or you have to buy sod from time to time to fill it in. And thus, there are a lot of sod businesses. Now, they'll come lay it for you, but their prices are high. But at the flea market, they also sold sod. Now, he didn't install it. He didn't deliver it. So along came one of those times, and there were just parts of my yard that were looking spotty, and I thought, what am I going to do? So I went over to, to the flea market one Saturday in my old green pickup truck. And I'm standing there. He's got pallets of the sod just all stacked up. And I'm, I'm looking at it. And you see those sod companies, they all like to talk about their, their guarantees when they advertise their sod on television. So I'm, I'm looking at it. And I said, well, you know, how much is it? And he told me. And I thought, well, okay, that's a lot better than the sod company. And I said, well... You know, tell, tell me about your guarantee. What's, what's the guarantee on this stuff? He says, ah, you know, you've been listening to them on the television. He said, here's my guarantee. If you don't water, it darn sure won't grow. <laughs> Proverbs 10, 11 reads, quote, like a fountain of water, the words of a good person give life. And Barnabas was described by Luke as being a good man. His words gave life. 
you know, as you read through the book of Acts, you see beautiful demonstrations of Barnabas' encouraging spirit and work. The beginning of chapter 10 tells about Saul, the persecutor of Christian, Christians, and his own dramatic encounter with Jesus Christ. He began to tell his story to anyone who would listen. And finally, he ended up making his way back to Jerusalem, where he had given witness to the death of the church's first martyr, that being Stephen. We pick up in verse 26 there, quote, When Saul arrived in Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, since they did not believe him to be a disciple. Barnabas, however, took him and brought him to the apostles and explained to them how Saul had seen the Lord on the road and that the Lord had talked to him. But there's even more about this matter of Barnabas being a good man. Not only was he an encourager, but we find in the second half of that verse in chapter 4, quote, and he, Barnabas, sold a field and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Again, context is important. Many of those who were coming to believe in Jesus were being put out of their homes and out of their jobs because they had come to faith in Christ. One page forward, as you're, as you're moving ahead, we read that the church was trying to feed large numbers of widows. But here is Barnabas generous Barnabas, taking an illiquid asset, a field, and selling it. It would no longer be his. He brings it to the apostles. And I really, really like that phrase. And he laid the money at the apostles' feet. In other words, no strings attached, no me telling you how you've got to do it. You do with it as you deem best. Presently, I'm serving on our denomination's general board. There are about 50 of us from around the world, and they seat us in alphabetical order for our annual meetings. To my right is Benjamin Longay from Mozambique, and to my left is Michael Johnson, a layman from Nashville, Tennessee. I knew Michael had been working on his doctorate, so I asked him how it was going. He said at that point he was up working on his dissertation. I asked about the theme. He said, well, I'm, I'm doing research and writing on the relationship between generosity and one's sense of purpose and fulfillment in life. <laughs> this was just prior to COVID. I said, well, that's interesting. I've been assigned by a pastor to preach this Sunday about generosity. So I asked, do you, do you have any resources you'd recommend? He took me to a website. The next day, when I got off the plane back here in western Ohio and checked my email, I noticed Amazon said I had been sent a book via Kindle as a gift. It was from Michael. The title of the book's, it, book is The Paradox of Generosity. It's co-authored by Christian Smith, who for the last many years has been leading a study at, at Notre Dame University called, quote, The Science of Generosity Initiative. Fascinating read. Uh, 2,000 Americans surveyed regarding their habits related to generosity in financial giving, relational generosity, neighborly generosity, and generosity in volunteering, and how these related to their own sense of happiness, purposefulness, and physical and emotional health. On top of that, the team spent several days each at the homes and work of 40 persons observing, interviewing, following the actions of these persons as relates to their own generosity. Now, I'm not here to, to make a book report, but it was fascinating to me to read that and then at the same time to think back to Jesus, the words of Jesus that that are recorded in Scripture, that it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. Here we are now some 2,000 years after Jesus, and here's some of what they learned in that study of Americans as relates to generosity. Quote, a lot of Americans are indeed very generous, but even more are not. Statistically, 
they discovered that very happy Americans volunteer nearly 10 times the amount, usually five point, on average 5.8 hours a month, that very unhappy Americans volunteer, which averages out to 36 minutes a month. You caught that, right? The average happy, the generous, those who were generous with their time in, in serving others, 10 times more, almost six hours a month versus those who spent 36 minutes or 30, yes, 36 minutes a month. Those were the very unhappy Americans. They went on. Those who practiced neighborly generosity, that is, those who had friends into their home, who cared for other people's children, who assisted a friend or a neighbor with a job at their house and matters like that, on a weekly basis were dramatically happier than those who only did so a few times a year or never at all. Furthermore, they discovered links between generosity and one's physical health. This, this was interesting to me. You might be familiar with, with the hormone cortisol, and it's secreted in the human body in response to stress. And in short, it can be beneficial, but over the long term, it's known to be detrimental to health, creating wear and tear on the body. So catch this. One recent experimental study showed that greater generosity with money is associated with lower levels of cortisol in the body. In that study, people who were stingy in giving money secreted higher levels of cortisol. This was due, the research suggested, suggested to people's own negative emotional responses to having behaved in such a miserly manner. <laughs> the authors note, quote, rather than generosity producing net losses in generally, in general, the more generously people give of themselves, the more of many goods they receive in turn. Sometimes they receive more of the same kind of the thing that they gave, money, time, attention, so forth, but more often and importantly, generous people tend to receive back goods that are even more valuable than those that they gave. Happiness, health, a sense of purpose in life, and personal growth. I read all of that and I thought, I imagine Barnabas was a very happy man. And hence, no wonder he was more disposed to be an encourager. Again, I'm asking the question... What about me? What would be my proofs of generosity had I been one of those 2,000 persons in that study? Are you generous? Not are you wealthy, not do you have extra time, but are you generous? So here's Barnabas, described as a good man, next full of the Holy Spirit. You know, we... We say things about what people are full of. Well, you know, he's full of malarkey, he's full of baloney, or some other things, full of himself. But Barnabas was described as being full of the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? I know that at times when people talk about the Holy Spirit and being filled with the Holy Spirit, you know, there's all these strange things that, that bubble up. It's, Ooh, you know, it's a little, it's a little spooky like to, to talk about being filled with the Holy Spirit. But you know, I think the best description of what it is to be filled with the Holy Spirit is in Galatians chapter 5. There, Paul wrote, Now the fruit or the display or the evidence of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And thus to be filled with the Spirit is to exhibit these characteristics. So how does that happen? Well, again, and I'll, and I'll rattle through these rather quickly. One is to be born of the Spirit. Jesus said to Nicodemus, John chapter 3, if you want to look at it later, a man must be born of water, that is fleshly birth, and of the Spirit. That is to come to faith in Jesus Christ as the Savior and Lord of your life. When we come to believe on Christ, 
We are given, yes, new status, but also we are what Scripture refers to as regeneration. We are made to live again. It is God's Spirit coming to live in us. Second is a complete surrender of yourself to God. To possess and have access to every part of you. You understand, he cannot fill what he does not have. And so when you come to the place of just saying, Lord, I want you to have all of me, then we give the Holy Spirit opportunity to fill every part of us. But then there's a third matter, and that is a continuing growth into him through the implanting of his word into your mind. Again, <laughs> if you'll forgive me, let me go back to my South Carolina yard. Uh, all the years I've ever been preaching, I'm confident I've never talked about yard twice in one sermon. But when, when I broke the news to our young daughters that we were going to be moving to South Carolina and they were going to have to leave their friends here in Ohio, in a moment of, of weakness, of feeling sorry for them, and without my wife being present, without any real forethought of what I was saying to them, I said, well, and we'll buy a house with a pool. <laughs> oh my. Well, that's, that's a story in itself. But anyway, we ended up buying a house that indeed had a pool out back. The previous owner had been a psychiatrist. And he had his own compulsions, and, and the most prominent was that he loved to plant things. He told me later on, he, he just moved to another house in, in the neighborhood there, and so he came over to, to tell us about the house and, and the yard and everything else. And he told me, he said, you know, at one point, I had 300 banana trees here in the backyard. He said it gave it a rather tropical aura. I thought, yeah, it's no wonder this place looked like a jungle when I moved in. But around the pool, of course, there was the concrete patio. And then behind that, there was this uh, short brick wall rounded up around one end of the pool. And, and there were five peach trees on the other side of that wall planted there in the yard. Well, the first year, we, we got some peaches. And I was like, hey, this is... This is really cool, we, and uh, this, is, this is awesome. So, I mean, they, they weren't great big peaches, but they were big enough, and I'm, I picked them, and, and, you know, my favorite fruit's peach cobbler. So, you know, I made the cobbler and got the Briars vanilla ice cream and all that good kind of stuff, and like, oh, this is great. And then I thought, okay, what do I need to do so that next year we have even better peaches? So I was reading about peach trees and how I needed to prune the trees and, you know, if you need to spray them and how much and when and, and all of the rest of that. Well, the next year came around, and there were fewer peaches, and they were even smaller than the year before. And I thought, oh, I wonder if it's just sort of like a, you know, some, you know, how some fruit trees, some years they do better than others, and I thought, well, that must have been what happened. Well, then we got around to the third year, and there were but just a couple of peaches, and in fact, one of the trees died. I thought, oh, no. So I waited, hoping, you know, it, it was, I, I thought, well, maybe it'll come back, but, but it didn't. So finally, I started digging. I knew I needed to take it up, and I started digging up that tree. What I found shocked me. That tree was still in the black plastic pail that it, that it was in when it had been bought. And evidently, my the former owner of the house, he had just gone out there, dug holes, and put those five trees in the black plastic pails right down in there. And so what happened was the trees were root-bound. That was the case for all of them. And all I could do was dig them up, cut them up, and haul them away. You know where this is going. Paul would write elsewhere, now let the word of Christ dwell in you richly or, or put another way deeply. And that's why in our tradition we emphasize that being born of the Spirit and yielding everything to God so he can have all of us to make us into his image. In other words, you cannot just become a Christian 
on your own. You can't just flip the page one day and, and say, well, today I'm, I'm a Christian and I'm going to start living like Jesus. It requires the Holy Spirit. And to be filled with the Spirit, to be filled with the Spirit of Christ is absolutely necessary to, to, to have the Spirit to live Christianly. But then there's responsibility on our part also. And that is to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, so that we can cooperate with the Holy Spirit and be full with Him. Barnabas was filled with the Spirit. If you squeezed him, if you poked him, out came the juices of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and self-control. And that's who we are. Perfectly? No. Always? Maybe not. But more and more and more and more. Until there is that time when, when we don't demonstrate that fruit, that everybody's more surprised by it than if we do. And it's, it's not that you've got to think about it. It's just... Who you've become. And that's who Barnabas had become, full of the Spirit. Well, there's one more. Barnabas is described as being a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. Of faith. He believed in God. He believed in Jesus all the way. He believed Jesus to be the Son of God, the way, the truth, and the life. And I ask you this morning, have you come to that place in your life? And if not, why not? What's holding you back? Could this be, and why shouldn't this be, your moment to believe? But Barnabas also had faith that God was leading his life. Acts 13, we find a church, a church like this one. And they were in a special time of emphasis on worship and fasting. And during that special time, they sensed God by his spirit saying to them, set apart Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And then after they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, quote, they sent them off. Where? And for what? What was their mission? Barnabas and Saul would become the first Christian missionaries, going intentionally into other parts of the world to share the good news of Jesus. Barnabas had completely given himself over to God and God's will for his life, and he was willing to trust God, to have faith in God to lead him. It takes faith. Because if you're going to follow God, you won't have all the answers beforehand. It set Barnabas out on a, on a personal trajectory. It obviously changed his life, but it also changed the world. The fact is that you, if you are now a follower of Jesus Christ, if you ran your spiritual ancestry back, it eventually would lead back to Barnabas and Saul very, very, very likely. It meant trusting God when he called them out. But it also meant trusting God when times were hard. You, you read Acts 13, 14, 15, and you find Barnabas and, and Saul, now called Paul, seeing many people come to faith in Christ. But at the same time, they were facing severe persecution. They were being misrepresented. They were lied about. They were on the run and beaten. Here just recently, I was thinking back over uh, the last couple of years and a number of the books that I've read that included a lot of, or several, I want to be careful here, several biographies of Christians who really, really made big differences in the world all of them in the 19th and 20th centuries. One was David Livingstone. You know, more people have heard about Livingstone than maybe really know his story, but this 
pioneer missionary to Africa. It just took my breath away when I realized, wow, he went through all of that to try to get the gospel into Africa. William and Catherine Booth, founders of the Salvation Army, fascinating story, but hard. John Lewis, former U.S. congressman, but he was Reverend John Lewis, just a young man who'd come from Alabama, and now there he was in Nashville, and, and his heart for racial justice and equity. He was the first to sit at those lunch counters in Nashville and and to have all sorts of things done to him. I read this book a little while back, just a couple years ago. A young man named Bruce Olson, 19 years old, who felt like God wanted him to go to South America to take the gospel to these Stone Age Indians. It's a fascinating story. I, I really couldn't believe that he didn't die. He almost did several times. And in every one of those stories and others like them, I find the common theme of challenge and hardship and sacrifice met with love and determination, a real sense of God's call, and a belief in the significance of what God had called them to. In fact, I've now come to wonder, and I don't think it would make much for me to make the case for me that if that hardship and sacrifice is really an, an indicator of the significance of the mission. They had faith in God. Faith in God and a real belief that God had called them and God had a mission for them. How about you? Uh, I know, I know. For us, uh, you know, we're just normal people average, living out our lives. Really? So there was Barnabas, the son of encouragement. May I challenge you, if you've not been in the practice of being an encourager, it, you, you just don't have to have a gift to do it. A lot of it's the discipline and the mindset and to say, Lord, help me to be an encouragement to someone else and to make it a practice every day, to find somebody to say, who can I encourage and how can I be an encouragement to somebody today? To be a person of generosity. Um, not, not saying you have to have much, but whatever you have, whether, whether it's of your person, whether it's of your time, whether it's of your money, to be a generous person. There was Barnabas filled with the Holy Spirit. Lord, I want to be filled with you. And full of faith. So what about you and what about me? And what will others write? Yeah, you know, what do I want them to be able to say about me? But even more importantly, what should God be able to say about me? I hope it won't be outside the realm of possibility that it can be said of us said of you, said of me, when people think about us. Yeah, she's really, really good. She's full of the Holy Spirit. I mean, you just got to know her. Full of faith. Yeah, he's a good guy. He's generous. He just seems to think like Jesus about things. And he just, he believes. He's all in. Followers of Jesus, good people, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. Lord Jesus, that's who we want to be. And so I pray that you will continue to mold us into your image. Holy Spirit, have us, all of us. Reshape our mind that we would think not after the ways of this world, but according to your mind. May we have the mind that's in Christ. Make us to be a blessing to others around us. And may we lean into, wholeheartedly, look for, seek for your mission on our lives and follow you 
with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We pray this in your name. Amen. I encourage you just to hang in here. Stay present for the worship that's to continue. And consider during this time what God is saying to you and your response to him. It's been great to be with you.